Hello, and thank you for watching our video of the presentation that we're about to give. Um, I am Rama al I'm a PhD student at Western University, and I'm a researcher and co-author on this research project. Uh, presenting with me today is Dr. Victoria Esses, who is the director of the Network for Economic and Social Trends. She is a professor at Western University and is the principal investigator of this research project. And with us also is Huda Hussein. She is the project manager of the London Middlesex Local Immigration Partnership. Before we begin with our presentation, we wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. As a settler, I begin today by respecting and acknowledging tr the traditional territory upon which we gather, the original peoples of Turtle Island. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse status and non-status indigenous people who call this territory home. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. We also acknowledge the historical fact that this land is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenepewak, and Adewanderon peoples. We acknowledge all the treaties that are specific to this area, such as the Two-Row Wampum Belt Treaty of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Silver Covenant Chain, the Beaver Hunting Grounds of the Haudenosaunee NAN-FAN Treaty of 1701, the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 with the Chippewa of the Thames and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee. The neighboring three indigenous nations to London and Middlesex are the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Munsee Delaware Nation, who all continue to live as sovereign nations with individual and unique languages, cultures, and customs. This land acknowledgement is a first step towards reconciliation and is the work of all residents, all settlers, to work towards decolonizing practices and bringing our awareness into action. I pass it over to Huda. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. The London and Middlesex Local Immigration Partnership, LMLIP, has been funded by Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada since 2009. One of the objectives of the LMLIP and the local immigration partnerships across the country is to facilitate integration of newcomers and immigrants and to create a more welcoming community. We've been working for many years with our partners here in the London and Middlesex area to combat racism to work on some projects that combat racism and discrimination. In order for us to support evidence-based anti-discrimination initiatives at the local level, in 2021, along with seven local immigration partnerships across Southwestern Ontario, we surveyed community members in each of the communities to examine experiences of discrimination in that region. We found that immigrants and racialized groups are more likely to face discrimination at work, place settings such as when applying for a job, for interviews, or asking for promotion, or at the job itself, as well as in public places such as, this, such as when using public transportation, going to stores or restaurants. We also found out that discrimination levels tend to be higher than in small and mid-sized communities than in large urban settings. Next slide, please. Now that we know that some groups faced discrimination in the London and Middlesex local, uh, in the London Middlesex region, we wanted to hear their stories. We wanted to hear more about to gain for three reasons. We wanted to gain detailed understanding of experiences of discrimination faced by immigrants, immigrants, racialized groups, the setting, the type of uh, discrimination, their responses, if there is any and also find out some possible strategies to counter discrimination in the region. We also want to explore the individual sense of belonging and how discrimination may influence their decision to stay in the London and Middlesex region. And finally, we wanted to get as a community, to find out as a community, what can we do together to face, to combat racism and discrimination. Next slide, please. 
Researchers conducted interviews via Zoom with 30 adult individuals. These were selected from immigrant and racialized groups who experienced discrimination in the last three years. The topics of the interviews included the following, description of the incident itself, the observers or the bystanders responses and reaction. We also wanted to see the respondents' uh, sense of belonging such in such incidents and how that may affect their decision to stay in the London and Middlesex area. We also wanted to see, we wanted to learn about the strategies that we can use to support these people who face discrimination. And we wanted to see the characteristic, if they want a characteristic of a reporting tool, what is it, what does it look like? How would it look like in order to be more effective, effectively used? And finally, we also wanted to have to gain some understanding of the supports that are there and put them together to help those who face discrimination. Next up, next slide, please. Just a few characteristics of the interviews that we did, the researchers have done. There were 27 female, two male and one non-binary. You notice that most of them were women and that depended on who uh, on the respondents who wanted to take that uh, research piece with us. The ages of the group were between 18 years old and 61 years. All but one were born in Canada. Those born outside of Canada had lived here for more than, for about seven years. Many have arrived on temporary visas, but more than half have since become either permanent residents or citizens. Many were South Asian, Latin American or black. Also, we had some East Asian and West Asian. Next slide, please. In terms of religion, many of the participants were Christian, some were Hindu, some were Muslim, and some having indicated no religion at all. Participants were generally well-educated and many were employed or students. I'll pass it on to Rama, please. Thank you. So I'll start us off with reporting some of the findings from the interviews themselves. These findings have been divided into uh, discrimination incidents within the workplace setting and those within the public place setting. So starting off with the workplace setting, respondents reported having derogatory language directed at them, being treated differently than others, and having their abilities questioned by patrons as well as patrons not, being, not wanting to be served by them. Throughout the presentation, you'll notice uh, blue highlighted text. Those are quotes that have been pulled out directly from the interviews. And so they are directly from the words of the participants themselves. And I'll be reading out some of them throughout. So one participant stated, so I asked them, what would you like? And they immediately turned to my coworker and they were like, I don't want her to take my order. I want you to make it. I went to put in the orders in the system for him and he again told my coworker, no, you put it, she might do it wrong. So then my coworker was like, no, it's fine, she'll do it right. So when I did and I printed the bill, he stood there for five minutes to check each and every one. He asked the price for each and everything and then he made sure that I had put all the orders in correctly. In addition, respondents reported being socially excluded, being stereotyped, being undermined, and in some instances, even being yelled at and physically attacked, either by coworkers or by superiors in their workplaces. Another participant said, and I quote, so yeah, I acknowledged him and he threw something at me. And then he did say he didn't want help from someone who wasn't from here. Next slide, please. In terms of responses, many of the discrimination incidents were observed by the respondents' co-workers, yet the co-workers did not seem to intervene. Uh, this was suggested that it may be because the co-workers didn't necessarily perceive the incidents as problematic. And one quote reads, because like I said, it doesn't click to everyone. Things like microaggressions, like I said, it takes you to know what's happening, to actually even acknowledge them. For me, I don't think that any of my colleagues would recognize those. They'd laugh it off. Moreover, a number of respondents did nothing in response to the discrimination themselves at the time because they were afraid of making the situation worse or worried about what the consequences would be for them in their workplaces. And one person said, and I think also as people of color, it almost comes back to us to not be very offended. But if you feel offended, you have to communicate in a very, I don't know, professional, if I may use that word, manner. Why? 
Why is the onus on me to correct you or tell you that that's not okay? Next slide, please. The discrimination that uh, respondents experienced also had negative uh, consequences for them. Particularly, they reported having negative emotions, feeling unsafe in the London Middlesex region, having their, their career either hindered or changed, and experiencing burnout or poor physical health. One respondent stated, I was feeling awful. I was feeling uncomfortable, especially because this happened in front of someone else. I felt ashamed at the moment. Another person said, the emotional aspect is real and disheartening. And also it just makes me not want to even work or live in a public place. Like kind of pushed me to going into remote work rather than being face to face with people. Next slide, please. In terms of reporting, some respondents did report the experience of discrimination, either to a superior or to HR after the incident. For some, that reporting did result in action. However, for others, it did not. For those who didn't report the experiences of discrimination, they often stated that they didn't think that that would have an impact and might even lead to negative consequences for them. One person says, so it was just kind of brushed under the rug really quickly. And I think they were just really afraid to talk about it. And it's a little weird because we all have, we have all of these trainings about DEI, and especially since these are our leaders, so they should have a little bit more specialized training to be able to handle situations or have these conversations. But I don't think they're there yet. Another person stated, you get discouraged because the amount of work that is involved and the upheaval of like, do you really want to piss off every manager and become the black sheep that later on you kind of screw yourself over when it comes to an opportunity of moving to a different department or applying for a job later? Do you want to be known as the troublemaker is basically what I'm trying to say. Next slide, please. Now, moving on to discrimination that occurred in public places, the most common public places that were reported were on public transit, in retail stores, or in common areas of share residences. However, participants also mentioned healthcare settings, parks, and schools. Respondents often had derogatory language directed at them and were treated rudely. One person describes we were sitting on the side in the back row and they just started throwing out racial slurs and out of nowhere, like we didn't even talk to them. You smell so bad, you're smelling like curry. This went on for a very long time, for a good 15, 20 minutes, or maybe even more than that. They started opening the windows and it was so cold that day. Another participant describes, we were just talking in Spanish and he turned to me and he said, you're in an English speaking country. So you have to speak in English, beep. And I think you can imagine the kind of language that was being used. Next slide. In terms of responses, uh, many respondents uh, also indicated that these incidents were observed by others in public places, yet no one intervened. Uh, the respondents thought that this may be because, uh, because um, bystanders or observers did not want to get involved. Similarly, many respondents did nothing in response to the discrimination themselves, often because they didn't know what to do or how to respond. One person uh, mentioned, I just kept quiet. I was more so in a state of shock, so I didn't know what to do. A state of shock and confusion, so I didn't do anything. I didn't fight back. I didn't talk back. I can't even remember if I said sorry or not. I truly can't remember. I was more so flabbergasted and like, okay, this is happening. That was my immediate response. In terms of personal consequences, many respondents reported having a wide range of negative emotions as a result of the discrimination that they had experienced. One person said, and I'm really upset about it and it's really hurting my heart. I remember I went home and I was crying. Another said, there's just the sense of inferiority and like we don't belong here and they're just better than us or something like that. I know they might not feel it at all, but we just think that they might also think that they're better than all of us. Next slide. 
In terms of reporting, uh, many of the respondents didn't report their experiences in any official way that they had experienced in public places. And often this was because they didn't know how to report the discrimination. They weren't sure of the consequences for them or for the perpetrators, or even what difference it would make if they reported. They often didn't think the incidents were serious enough to report, or felt like it was not the wor worth the time and effort to go through the reporting process. One person stated, and I quote, one, I don't know where to report it. Two, I don't know if I report it, how much scrutiny I will have to go through. Or also, I don't have the details of this person. And the third thing, and maybe that's the major reason behind why I didn't report it, because, you know, we kind of see the discrimination coming, right? When we decided to move, we knew that this will happen. And, you know, it's just something that you internalize, right? And you feel that, you know, it's just a small little incident and it's fine. You know, this will keep happening. So how many times will you go and report? And, you know, is it even worth reporting? Is it even worth your time to go and report and talk about it and live it again and again and again? Or just, you know, shrug it off and move on. I pass it over to Vicky. Thank you, Rama. So we asked all respondents um, whether the discrimination they experienced uh, made them feel less welcome and less like they belonged in the London Middlesex region and um, whether it influenced their decision to stay in the region. Um, and here are some quotes of what people said. It made me realize that some people don't necessarily see me as just having an equal right to be here. And another person said, I do think of moving away because this happened to me and I don't want it to happen again. Next slide, please. Now, some people did feel a sense of belonging to London and Middlesex, despite the discrimination they'd experienced. And this had to do with um, feeling sometimes that uh, there were some nice people in the region. Um, one person talked about um, having uh, a child and how that um, helped them to make connections with others, um, getting involved with play groups, uh, to the library. And so in this way, this person was able to make friends in the region and then finally said, well, London is home, Canada is home, I belong here. And finally, another thing that was repeated a number of times was that the fact that there are more and more people of different races, nationalities and immigrants here, um, makes people feel that they're not the only visible minority and it's especially important when they go to places and they feel that people like them are in um, senior positions and managerial positions or executive positions It makes them feel more a sense of belonging to the region. Now we've been told a number of times that people don't really know what to do when they experience discrimination and uh, they don't know who to report it to. And we've been talking for a while about developing a tool for reporting discrimination in the region. So we asked our respondents what type of tool they would use, whether they would use a tool and what it should be like for them to be able to use it. And we found that a large majority of respondents indicated that they would be likely to use an electronic reporting tool, um, such as a website or an app, if it were available. However, the use of a reporting tool would depend on it having specific features. First of all, it was indicated that it would be important for a reporting tool to be anonymous and confidential. Um, people did mention that uh, the ability to provide your own contact information for follow-up should be optional, and some did not want to be able to provide, or some did not want to personally provide their own contact information. Um, it was repeatedly mentioned that the um, host needed to be neutral, independent, and culturally sensitive. For example, a local community organization they could relate to. And many people spontaneously said that they did not want the police or the government to be hosting this tool. It was also mentioned that the reporting tool had to be easy to use with clear instructions. It had to be short and have very straightforward questions. It should be available in multiple languages to be easy to use. And people um, mentioned the ability to upload videos and documents. And we know now when people um, view discrimination, view incidents, they often are taking videos on their phone. So the ability to 
um, later upload those videos or upload a report or a document that they've put together on the incident is important. Um, our respondents also said it was very important um, that the tool have very clear information about who has access to this information and what they'll do with it. That is not just to have a reporting tool, but be very clear at what we're gonna do with the reporting tool. And uh, that it should also be linked with information about supports that would be available for those who have experienced discrimination. So um, respondents were asked uh, what type of supports they thought would be useful for those who experienced discrimination for themselves and others. And respondents described a number of different types of supports and resources that should be available for those who've experienced discrimination. One of the things I mentioned repeatedly was the importance of being heard and being taken seriously. Um, not having it brushed under the carpet, not being told it wasn't important, but being heard and being seen to be um, talking about something that was uh, serious. Um, respondents also uh, repeatedly said that immigrants and racialized people should be consulted on any initiatives that are being developed to support them. They suggested that we provide spaces and support groups for those who have experienced discrimination to talk to either mental health professionals or other immigrants and racialized people who've had similar experiences. And they also mentioned just creating spaces for immigrants and racialized people to come together in general and just share their life experiences and their experiences in the region. In addition to addressing discrimination from individuals, it was mentioned uh, that we need to address systemic issues and be proactive to create change, not just always reactive after something has happened. Now, they also talked about two types of uh, education. First of all, educating and raising awareness among the broader community, including those who are discriminating and those who have power to make change um, about discrimination. So classes, workshops, events to encourage education and interaction. They also mentioned the importance of educating immigrants and racialized people about their rights and what exactly constitutes discrimination. How can you identify discrimination? And uh, these quotes we think are very apt in um, uh, matching uh, uh, what people said. So for example, I think we're more of a reactive community instead of a proactive community. I, do, I think we do more, oh, that bad event happened. We should do walks, we should do this, we should educate. Why can't we do that beforehand? And another person said, sometimes we as racial minorities, we sometimes don't understand that what just happened is not right. We also sometimes don't accept, okay, that was racism. So, you know, just to reach out to these people for everybody to be able to identify discrimination and maybe look for support. And then finally, the onus should be on racist people and the people who do these things need to learn to stop this stupidness because the onus can't always be on me because people need to stop behaving badly. They need to figure out what their problem is, learn about their problem, resolve it, and leave me out of it. So based on uh, these interviews, uh, we came up with a number of recommendations. And the first set of recommendations are for businesses and employers. We understand that many businesses and, and employers have regulations, have policies on non-discrimination, but from these interviews, it's very clear that these policies don't always work. Um, so our first recommendation is to have a clear, explicit policy on non-discrimination and zero tolerance of employee harassment with very specific steps to take if one experiences discrimination so that people know if I've experienced discrimination, this is what I do. And then very clear consequences for those who violate the policy. So everybody knows in advance that if you violate this policy, this is gonna be the consequence for you. Our second recommendation for businesses and employers is to implement a straightforward and confidential procedure for reporting experience of discrimination um, and that this procedure has to formally document the investigation and the outcomes so that there is a formal procedure and there's a documentation of what, was, what steps were taken to address the situation and what the outcome of this investigation was. And our third recommendation for businesses and employers is to provide employee training focused on countering stereotypes, 
encouraging perspective taking and education about what constitutes discrimination, including microaggressions, as well as bystander intervention training. As you'll remember, Rama talked about um, co-workers not often responding or doing anything about uh, viewing discrimination. Uh, we also have recommendations for the community at large for London Middlesex. And the first is to develop a zero tolerance of discrimination community protocol for the region and clearly display notices of the community protocol in public places. So not only to say that we're uh, a non-discriminatory community, but to have a protocol for our region and have notices in the area to say, um, and in public places that this is what we believe and our community is going to aim for zero tolerance of discrimination. Second recommendation is to provide education to the broader community about the benefits of immigration to the community, the discrimination that's being experienced in our community and the damage caused by this discrimination. You're not only discriminating when you perpetrate these acts, you're actually hurting people. And uh, when you saw some of those consequences for people, it really makes us, you know, it makes us, our hearts bleed and it should make the people who are doing these acts um, also feel very bad and um, unsettled about what they've done. Um, we also recommend providing training for the public and for staff of public facilities focused on countering stereotypes, encouraging perspective taking, what's it like when somebody has these experiences, education about what uh, constitutes discrimination. So for example, people tell racist jokes and they don't think that's discrimination. Well, it is, and they need people need to know this and as well as bystander intervention training. We know that when people witness discrimination, they don't always act they, because they don't know what to do, they freeze. And uh, by having bystander intervention training, people know what to do and it will become more automatic to intervene. Next slide, please. Additional recommend, recommendations include, of course, developing a discrimination reporting tool that is widely advertised in our community and provides information on supports that are available for those who experience discrimination. Our fifth recommendation um, has to do with this idea of education. So providing information to immigrants and racialized individuals about what constitutes discrimination, including microaggressions, that microaggressions are not fine, they are discrimination, uh, what people's rights are when they have these experiences, and the specific steps that they need to take or they should take if they experience discrimination in the region. And then finally, um, provide immigrants and racialized individuals with support groups and safe places to discuss their experiences with each other and to um, seek professional help and resources when it's needed. So this is a summary of our report. The full report is available on the, on the London and Middlesex Local Immigration Partnership website at this link. Um, and uh, when you go to this link, you just have to look for this in-depth report on cases of discrimination in London, Middlesex and strategies to combat it. Next slide, please. And we thank everybody for taking the time to listen to us today. If you have questions, if you have comments, please don't hesitate to contact one of us or all of us uh, with your questions and comments. And thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the organizers for having us as well. Thanks, everyone.